All right, we want to welcome you to Wednesday night Bible study. We're here at home this evening, and Sister Diane wasn't feeling well, so I told her I would just stay in tonight, and hopefully we didn't uh, miss too many at the church. But again, we welcome you to Wednesday night Bible study here at the house, and I stayed in with Sister Diane not feeling well, and uh, you can pray for her if you'd like to do so. We'd appreciate that. And um, the last couple of weeks, we have uh, been studying uh, the subject of Jesus and uh, uh, his ministry, his coming. And tonight, uh, I want to just uh, take a little bit of turn with that subject and study about living for Jesus. Um, the greatest privilege ever afforded to man is the opportunity to live for God. And uh, again, we understand that uh, the Father sent his Son to the world to save and redeem humanity. And in doing so, uh, to provide a way that man could uh, live for God. Um, when we think about uh, living for Christ, there's an old cliche I was thinking about today, and it went something like this, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. And uh, no human we'll look at another human um, and see perfection. Uh, I don't know anybody perfect. And uh, the only one who was perfect as we study the word of God uh, was Jesus Christ. But his coming and his washing us and cleansing us by the blood of the lamb puts us in a position that his righteousness, his sinlessness, if you will, uh, is imputed to our life. I was meditating today. I was uh, preparing my heart for Bible study. And I was thinking about uh, the Israelis, the Jewish people in bondage in Egypt, and how the, the Lord had directed Moses and told, them, told him that he was going to take them out. He was going to deliver them. And I often think about Egypt as a representative of sin. You know, before I was uh, born again, before I became a Christian, I lived in Egypt. I lived in bondage. I lived in sin. But through the blood of Jesus Christ and his cleansing power, uh, when we were redeemed, uh, he, he set us free. He delivered us from Egypt. And the direction that God gave to Moses uh, was to kill the Passover lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it over the door, the lintel and the doorpost uh, of the house. And his promise was, that everyone who stayed in the house under the blood when he passed through Egypt in judgment, that uh, he would pass over them. And so we understand as a Christian, though we're not perfect in our self, in our effort, in our works, in our walk, we know that when God looks at us, he looks at every believer through the blood of Jesus Christ. If the blood has been applied to our lives, uh, and again, when we're born again, that's exactly what happens through the agency of the Holy Spirit from Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary, carrying his blood forth into the heavenlies as our high priest after we uh, come to Christ and we're born again, then God looks upon us. And when he looks at us through the blood, he sees us perfect in Christ. Now we ought to rejoice 
Now you're at home in your house, church, tonight, and we're here gathered around the Word of God to study, and uh, we want to remind you of the great redemptive work. Again, the last couple of weeks we've studied about Jesus, and tonight we, we just want to talk about living for Christ. It saddens my heart, and I've heard people say and make quotes, I don't know how to live for God. I could never be that perfect. Uh, I give up now before I even get started. And, and that's sad, because the truth of the matter is, none of us start knowing how to live for God or live a Christian life. Now, our granny or our mother grandmother, our parents may have set an example and we watch them live for Christ, but on a very personal level and just an analogy I always think about when we start our walk in Christ, uh, because I have a distinct memory of when my children started walking and how my wife and I would separate a certain distance and we would have our child walk between us. If your parents, probably you did that same ritual and we would encourage them and they would be proud to take a few steps. Uh, but often in their learning, they would fall down. They didn't walk perfectly. We would rush over and pick them up and get them restarted. And don't you know that's how God works in our life? If we would only surrender to him, and for the one that says, I don't know how to live for Jesus, well, how about you letting Jesus live through you and in you? Because when you surrender, the Bible said to, to offer and to present ourselves as a living sacrifice and when we present ourselves to God and, and uh, we remove our will and we put our flesh down and we say, God, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, you're my Master, you're my Teacher, you're my Guide, then God has the ability through Christ to live in and through us and help us in our daily walk. I want to encourage uh, you believers that in the day and age that we live in, Jesus said, see that no man deceive you. Be watchful, be aware. We don't want to allow anybody to get in between us and the Lord. Don't let anybody hinder us. Don't let anybody stop us but keep our eyes focused on the Lord and live daily for him. So we're going to get into some scripture uh, tonight and just study a little bit of the word of God just on a personal testimony just before we do, because I can only come from my vantage point. I had to learn to walk with Christ, but I would not exchange my life for Christ, for anything in this world. I don't regret the years of living for the Lord. Was I perfect all along the way? No. But I was sincere. So here, here's what we got to do. We commit our life to God, and we keep on keeping on. We keep walking. And day by day, that turns into weeks and months, and then the months turn into years living for Christ, learning how to walk, growing in the word, coming to a great understanding of our life in Christ, and also uh, maturing in, in our surrender and uh, uh, to his lordship. Well, I haven't arrived. We haven't arrived but we're not what we was when we got started. Uh, there has been growth. There has been maturity. So let's, let's get into some scripture tonight. I want to start in Hebrews, the sixth chapter. So if you have your Bibles there in your house, church, hey, thank God we, we really 
our, our back to church and having churches in our facility, I mean, having church at our church and our facility on Sunday and been having some Wednesday nights. And we want to, if you're not churched, we'd like to invite you, but be faithful to your own church. They're preaching Jesus Christ and they're exalting the Lord then I just encourage you to stand by your pastor, stand by your church, and we're trying to just get reestablished, particularly on our morning services. And then, uh, obviously, uh, we will be having our Wednesday night and our Sunday night, too. Well, let's read the scriptures. Hebrews 6, and the very couple of first verses there, let, let's read that. And it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, I've been teaching some of the doctrines and the principles of Christ in the last couple of weeks, his coming, his ministry. But this scripture challenges us and encourages us to move forward, to, to, to go on. It said, let us go on unto perfection. Boy, there's that word that scares everybody to death. I'm not perfect. I can never be perfect. Well, in the sight of God through the blood of Jesus and Christ's righteousness becoming your righteousness, God can look upon you and see the perfect sacrifice that was given for your life. That is an encouragement. Amen. And he said, but let us go on into perfection. And here's what is an encouraging. Paul said, he that began a good work in me is able to perform it unto the day. Every day you read the word, you pray, you walk for Christ and you live for him. God is working and bringing completion in your life. He is performing in you through the word of God by the Holy Spirit, that trophy of grace that when he comes or when you die and you stand before him, God will offer you as perfected in Christ and you will be a trophy of his grace in eternity. And I, I just love those words of, of Paul. God is going to complete the work that he started in us. And I also love the verse of scripture. You know, there are people around, they, they want the reward. They want the blessing. They don't always want to pay the price. Paul was the same. One. And, and friend, there is a cost to, to live for Christ. There is a personal dedication. There is a consecration. There is a responsibility that we have uh, in our walk with the Lord. And Paul said, uh, I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Somewhat the touch or the blessings of God say, I believe in God, but they don't want to commit their soul to his keeping for their soul salvation. Just give me the reward. Just just let heaven be my home, whether I live for you or not, God. So there, there is a dedication in living for Christ. And this scripture says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. You see, when you were in sin, all of your works were of sin. You yielded your vessel to absolute dead works. But when you were born again, when you were washed by the blood of the Lamb, uh, you, you were resurrected unto life. You were resurrected unto godly works, to righteous works, to, to new works, if you will. And uh, the scripture here, he's teaching us to not lay the foundation again for the old law who, who could not bring any perfection, only showed us we were lawbreakers like we've talked about before. And then he began to enumerate here. He, he talked about repentance from the dead works of faith towards God. Where does our perfection in Christ come from and our ability to walk? Uh, it's out of our faith in God. Every day you get up, it's it's a 
It's a new day to walk by faith. The Bible said the just does not walk by sight. They walk by faith. And through our faith, we commit our life to Christ. Then as Christ lives in and through us, he, he teaches us how to live for him. He teaches us how to walk through him. The word of God gives us knowledge and understanding and instruction. Can I remind you this? Jesus intended for uh, converts and for disciples to obey him. He told his disciples, go teach them whatever I've commanded you. He also said, my grievous or my commandments are not grievous. God expects obedience out of you and I. And uh, if we love him, we, we will obey him. So every day as a believer, we get up with the sole purpose of living and walking out our faith in Christ. And this scripture that we're reading, we're going to get a little bit deeper, but he mentions to them in that second verse of doctrines of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments. And I, I thank God for the doctrines of truth that uh, we, we have that are foundation in our faith. I was touched by a de particular denomination in my life that in their literature, they had a section called practical teachings. And in those practical teachings, they, they glean from the word of God guidelines that if you would put into practice, practical teachings, that you would walk out your faith day by day, just in, in shoes. You see, here's the truth. If, if our faith doesn't work every day, then it, it's, it's not a very great faith. If living for Christ is not a reality, then uh, uh, we're, we're sadly short in our religious belief. But the truth is, Jesus not only came, he not only gave himself, he not only in his ministry sought disciples, he teaches his disciples how to be overcomers and live for him in a very practical way. I want to go back up to the fifth chapter. It's probably just above the couple of scriptures that I read to you. I want to look at Hebrews 5 and verses 12, and we'll just finish the chapter. And, and look what it, it says here. It says, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. I was teasing with a fellow preacher and we were texting back and forth this week, and we he he was mentioning about maturity and growing up in God, and living for God. Uh, we don't stay in in baby form our whole life. I sure pray to God from the day I got saved until 2020. There there has been a lot of difference in my growth and in my understanding of my walk with God. And I told the dear brother, I said, I like what one preacher said. And he told him, he said, now I don't mind giving you the bottle, but he said, it's pretty embarrassing when I have to part your beard. And I think we can take the point in just like my children, when I was helping teach them to walk and learning how to get their feet under them and to become stable. Had they not successfully done that, there would have been a point that I could have possibly taken them to a doctor and say, what's wrong with my child? He's not progressing. He's not being able to get his feet under him and he he's not walking on his own. And it, it, it's time that... Uh, he, he ought to be able to stand on his two feet. And that's what I want to talk to you some about tonight. You know, you can't walk it out for me. There are times I've said, and not that I think I'm holy, 
uh, just appreciate the compassion of my heart. And I said, man, we just wish we could live it for them. But the truth of the, the fact is the Christian walk, your soul salvation, even though we can encourage one another, you have to walk for Christ yourself. You have to live your Christian life for yourself. I've just had the feeling through the years, if people who quit before they even get started could really feel and understand the love of Jesus in their heart, like those of you that love him, know him. And if they could just understand he's not against them, he's for them. Jesus wants to help us walk. He will help us walk. He wants to grow us up and mature us. He wants to bless us with feet that can stand stronger. Uh, he is the greater one living in us. So therefore, we overcome the world, right? And some people have an end of image of God that he's mean or he, he looks with the all-seeing eye as a way to press them down or to condemn them to hell. Friend, God's looking for a way to live in you and through you, and he's just waiting for you to cry out to him and say, help, and, and he'll get your feet, his feet, your feet under you. But anyway, so here we go. We're, we're not going to uh, stay immature. We're not going to uh, uh, teeter like babies. But here, Paul, I believe Paul wrote this. He's saying when, when you should have grown enough to be a teacher, you're still needing to be taught. So the one thing about living and walking for God, we grow up. We mature. We're not always in the beginning stages, but it's through a spiritual work in our life. Our daughter, uh, when uh, she was newborn, uh, they just almost marked her as a failure to thrive baby. We were having trouble with the milk. And of course, we were much in prayer that the Lord would touch her. And just before they were going to go in and do an exploratory surgery on her, uh, we believe God to his glory. He, he turned that around. And as far as I know, she never had a problem. And man, she took off. And the failure to thrive began to thrive and, and to be blessed of God. And right here, he said... Uh, we don't teach the first principles of the oracles of God, but he said that there are those who have become such as need milk and not of strong meat. One way we grow in our walk is through the study of the scripture. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That worked when I was a kid. That might work with my grandbabies. But I need a prayer of understanding now of some spiritual growth, getting down the road past milk in my walk and learning how to eat strong meat. I, lo I love milk, uh, but I like some meat too uh, of growth. He said, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So here we are studying the word of, of God tonight, uh, considering our walk in the Lord, living for Jesus, how we can do it. And friend, we do it by literally growing up in him and pursuing our relationship. And that 14th verse said, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know, for a new convert, God doesn't expect them to walk as a matured believer. That's why if you have someone maybe you've been witnessing to or you've tried to encourage a loved one to go for God and and uh, they might say, and, you know, I can't live a godly life like grandma did. You know, just encourage them to surrender their life and to surrender their heart and let Christ do it. And the truth is, uh, having pastored for these years, I know there are Christians 
who have admitted struggles in their walk, struggles in their their life, uh, endeavoring to grow, endeavoring to mature. Can I tell you tonight, and those of you that have joined us for this study, there's never a place to turn around. There's never a place to quit. Uh, never become so discouraged that you just throw your hands up and say, I pray or I read the Bible and this isn't working. You know, see, the devil will give you every excuse of why you can't serve God. Now, it's not maybe biblical, but there's a good principle, a quote that I like, uh, winners never quit and quitters never win. We've got to abide in Christ. We're going to read some more scripture to you tonight. Let's turn over into the book of Galatians. Now, our walk with Christ, of course, is, is uh, born of our faith. And this, this scripture in Galatians 2 and verse number 16 is where I want to call your attention. Galatians Galatians 2 and 16, I think we'll read down through maybe uh, verse 20 or 21. He said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Where does our perfection come from? It's not by good works. You know, there's people again that we've talked about before. They feel like if they could live by the Ten Commandments, somehow or another, they would be perfected by God. Well, they wouldn't be because the law doesn't make anybody perfect. As we've taught before, it just shows you you're a lawbreaker. So when, when we talk about perfection in our life for Christ, and then we understand we're faulty and, and, and we're living this life in, in the flesh, which we don't live in the flesh as a Christian, but we live in this body. The Bible teaches we're supposed to live in the spirit, walk in the spirit. And if we do, then it dominates the flesh. And, and out of our faith experience, that's where God sees perfection. Again, back to Egypt. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He said, if I don't see the blood, he said, everybody that stays in the house, everybody that stays under the blood, he said, there will be no death in the house. Get it, child of God. Your perfection is through Christ alone. Your perfection comes in the applied work, the, the blood of Jesus Christ over you. Again, when God looks at you, he sees you through Jesus. He sees you through the perfect Son of God. And He sees you through your faith and your spiritual experience. And when men would point their finger and say, look at your warts, look, oh, I know something about you. Look at your faults, look at your failure. And here's the difference between those who live in open sin and a Christian who may not be perfect, but they're forgiven. I do not go live in open sin. Can I sin? Yes. Is that imperfection? Yes. But I don't practice sin. And don't be confused about it. Keep, keep a short list. If you fail God, if, if you're convicted of a sin, go get that under the blood. Go repent of it. Go turn from it. Go deny it. And, you know, sinners can point their finger and say, well, I've watched Christians. They're not perfect. Well, I don't claim to be perfect outside of Christ. My perfection or my righteousness is in him alone. But I don't make an excuse for sin either. There's some who would have all their confidence that their denomination is going to save them, or their trust and in experience in 1920 when they repented of their sin and they're careless in their life, and maybe people in the world wouldn't even know they're a Christian by their actions. There is a responsibility to identify with Christ. I was thinking about Peter today when uh, the young maiden saw him and said, uh, you're, you're one of his disciples. You know Jesus. 
And Peter tried in every way to not identify with him, say, I don't know him, cursed, I don't know him, tried to deny him. He said, oh yeah, you even talk like him, you're, you're one of them. Well, there is an identity in Christ, but let's begin to read here. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even when we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith. I like that word, justified. I've said it 10 million times, just as if I had not sinned. When you're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, you're justified before God. You're perfected in Christ. When God looks upon you, it's just as if I had not sinned. Justified. We did sin, but we're forgiven. The blood has been applied. Now there is the righteousness of Christ uh, on our life. And he said that we might be justified by faith. How do we live for the Lord day by day? We do it by faith, child of God. This morning I got up with an attitude of prayer, planning on being at the church office and was there several hours today and had the opportunity to pray and had the opportunity to, to study. And, 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 and it's a building up of our faith. We often refer to children, which it's a terrible thing, but we'll talk about the terrible twos. Uh, we might be sorry we helped teach them to walk. Not really. Uh, it's, it's all a process of learning and growing and gaining in God. And I want to encourage us tonight uh, and, and remind us how just, just like justification comes by faith, our perfection in Christ comes by faith. And he goes on to say, and not by the works of the law. You, you can't be good enough to be perfect because you'll blow it. Got some of my friends that have been able to go to the Holy Land and, uh, that's something I'd love to do in this life, but if I don't get to in this life, I know according to the scriptures, one day uh, I'll, I'll go to the Holy Land if it's not till Revelations 19. But anyway, uh, I would tease with those that I have been in direct contact who went, and I said, well, you're going to go walk where Jesus walked. And we'd laugh and, and we'd talk about the significance of being there. And I'd say, well, my problem is about walking where Jesus walked. My problem is walking like Jesus walked. I grew up here and I'm seeing to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. That's all I ask all through life's journey, to be like him. Do we really mean it? Uh, living the Christian life is an endeavor to live like Jesus lived to love like Jesus lived, to obey the word of God, to obey his commandments, to love the Lord, where when we present ourselves a living sacrifice, where we surrender our life, we say, here I am, Lord. You just take me and you just live through me and God just grow me up in you and just do everything you need to do in my life God, that I might be a witness of Christ and that you can take me on into that glorious perfection one day. And, and it's a work by faith. So we, we know it's not just obeying a bunch of laws and rules. That, that'll never get you perfected. It'll get you frustrated. You know, the Pharisees, they were so tied up with law and legalism and rule books and washings and, and I've done this and I've done that. Friend, it isn't what you've done. It isn't what I've done. It's what he's done in us that makes all of the difference. And he'll teach us how to walk and live for him. He said, but if while we seek to be justified, let me put perfection in there. But if while we seek to be perfected by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. We can't be justified in Christ. People say, 
Well, I'm, I'm a sinner. Paul didn't call you that. He called you saints. He said unto the saints of the household of God. Now, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I think sometimes we throw that around because we want to say I'm a sinner and then it doesn't look so bad if somebody catches a sin of sin. Just take my point. I'm not going to be a saint after I die. If you're in God, if you're covered by the blood, if you're living in the word of God, led and guided by his spirit, the flesh is crucified. Paul said, the life I now live, he said, he lives by Christ living in him. And we'll get to that. But, but notice what I'm saying. You're a saint of God now, not after you die. Let me tell you, if you're not a saint in this life, it don't matter what they call you in that life. They can put any title they want to or not. You're, you're sainted in God because you're justified by faith, washed and clean, perfected. And, and the Bible said that we are sanctified by the washing of the water of the word. How do I learn? I get into the scripture. I read the word of God. I feed my soul, build my soul up in the word of God. I strengthen my spirit uh, in the word of God. And it, it makes us stronger as we live and, and walk out our daily life for Christ. So he, 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 Christ is a minister of life. He's not a minister of sin. But he said, for if I build the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Friend in Christ, he said he didn't destroy the law. He fulfilled the law. But he brought it full circle in that that the law could not perform in our life. Christ performed it in us. The law couldn't make anyone perfect, but the blood of Jesus could. The sanctifying washing of the word could, and, and that is shouting territory. Let's go on and see what he said here. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Every day you get up and you walk out your Christian life through faith, not by sight, you do it to perform this, this very thing, that I might live unto God. Amen. You don't live to a denomination. You might appreciate a denomination. You don't live unto a church. You might appreciate your local church. But, but you live unto Christ. No church will perfect you. Only Jesus Christ will perfect you. And, and here's the key. Uh, if a man's dead to the flesh, that means he's alive to the spirit. And Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Crucifixion, you die. Those who would try to tell us Jesus just passed out and they stole his body and he, 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 he just fainted baloney. I got a word for that, baloney. He was crucified unto death. And when the Roman soldier come to break his leg, he realized he didn't need to break his leg so he could no longer push himself up to breathe. He was dead. Jesus said uh, that he placed himself in the hands of the Father. He gave up the ghost and died. Spiritually, when we die to the law and we die to the flesh, we come alive in Jesus Christ, and there's the key. When people say, I'm going to give up, I cannot be perfect, I couldn't live a Christian life. Well, you can't live a Christian life, but Christ in you, he can live through you and teach you how to live the Christian life. I love it. He said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. Jesus didn't just come to this earth incarnate to live. He come to this earth to live in you and me. Amen. And he is the teacher. He's the master. And we're the disciples. And a disciple is a learner. You say, Brother Darrell, what are you learning? 
I'm learning every day to walk like Jesus. I was thinking today, and it's one I use on the church through the years, and uh, if Ben, my brother, was here, he'd shame me about right now. He'd say, I heard that preacher before. But several years ago, they had, a lot of Christians were wearing these little rubber bracelets, and it had WWJD on the bracelet, and I guess it was a reminder that they were Christians walking for Christ, and the initials stood for, what would Jesus do? Well, I, I said, some people have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that's a blessing, but I'm, I'm, I'm blessed beyond that, too. I've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and Sister Diane, and if I don't hear the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, then my wife will help me uh, learn how I ought to walk and do some teaching in my life. So I would tease and I would say, I need a bracelet, WWDD. What would Diane do? I'm having some fun with you, but ain't it the truth? Uh, these little mamas and wives, they can sure instruct you and let you know uh, how you ought to be walking. And you know, the world may never honor you as a Christian, as a believer, but let them perceive that you're claiming something that you're not walking out. And it's amazing how they'll, by their words, they'll show you they understand how a Christian ought to live. Do you get my point? They might say, I can't live it but they know how you ought to be living it, right? God help us. Well, anyway, I better get back to this. So Paul was saying you got to die to live. And if you die to live, and if you let Christ live in you, he said the life I now live in the flesh, he's still in his body, but he said I live it by faith of the Son of God. Faith is operating, the agency of the Holy Spirit. You, you see, Jesus picks you up where you're at, but he don't leave you in that condition. He saves you. He gives you the milk. He begins to grow you and mature you. He begins to speak to your heart through the Bible, by the Holy Spirit, you begin to get your footing under you. You're learning to walk for the Lord, and he begins to introduce meat into your spiritual life. And when you used to set, I remember when I used to be taught, I, I can recall as a child experiences I had. My grandmother was in the Nazarene church for over 50 years. I had a deep spiritual experience under the old balcony. The balcony's not even in that building anymore, but when I was a child there in First Nazarene with Grandma Zenigati, uh, I was uh, standing back in and we were seated that Sunday under the balcony and I was a small child but they were singing the song, I love to tell the story. And I'm witnessing and testifying to you that God that day absolutely visited the, the child's heart. And he put a hook in my jaw in that Nazarene church that day that I've never been able to outrun and live uh, and 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 live without the knowledge. I love to tell the story, and here I am, in in years beyond that, called to preach, been preaching the gospel, and that very song that day became a reality in my life. But it started in a child's heart, and now I have the privilege. I'm telling the story tonight. I'm being able to share the gospel tonight. But you know, God dealt with me as a child. He's still dealing with me. He's still maturing me. He's still growing me under the day of fully. You're not going to be totally perfected until you're delivered into his presence. And we're all going to be 
uh, delivered into his presence one day by, by his saving grace and by his keeping power. Bible said, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. He, he, he said, we are to abide in him for without him, we can do nothing, right? So the good work he started in that child, he's still working today. He's still perfecting just like you that are in your Bible tonight. You love God. You're saved. Or there could be somebody looking in tonight. God's dealing with them. Hey, what are you waiting on? Uh, God will perfect you. You don't have to live this on your, your own. You don't have to ask what would Diane do. Ask what Jesus would do and then go for God and let him teach you uh, how to walk this thing out in shoe leather. Friend, it'll work in shoe leather and it'll work every day. So Paul is just simply testifying uh, of, about the, the life that, that he is living in the Lord and that his flesh is crucified and that through faith, the Son of God, he said, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Just like the Jews sacrificed the Passover lamb in Egypt, that lamb died for them that they would have blood to put over the lintel, the top of the door, and the side post. And just like God said, because you see, here's the thing about it. Uh, the scripture will work in your life and my life just like God said it. He said, go get under the blood, stay under the blood. If you don't stay under the blood, then you're going to die. And friend, it works the same way. We, we've got to stay crucified to our old will and our flesh. We've got to stay under the blood. We've got to let God perfect us. If we ever try to do it on our own, we're going to fall flat and, and, and just make a miserable uh, mess out of it. But when the death angel passed through Egypt, every house that had the blood was seen as savable, perfectable. God saw them through the blood. Are you under the blood? Are you born again? Do you know Christ lives in you? Do you know that you're endeavoring daily to walk for the Lord? Well, He'll, he'll do it in you and through you. Verse 21, I love this. Either we live by the law or we live by grace. Either we got a church book, rule book in our hand like the Pharisees. I was thinking about the rich young ruler this week. You remember when Jesus confronted the rich young ruler and uh, he had asked Jesus, he said, uh, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus didn't say, obey the 10 articles of the church. He didn't say, go get baptized at the church first of the chosen or whatever. Uh, but he, he spoke to him about the word, the commands of God. And I can just see the young ruler kind of put his thumbs up under his suspenders and just swell his chest out. And he said, well, he said, I've kept all those commandments from my youth up. Like he kept them in perfection. Well, Jesus knew he didn't keep them in perfection. Jesus knew he was lacking before he ever told him. And, uh, but he asked the Lord, what, what must I do for eternal life? And let me just give you a freebie right here. For you to have eternal life and live in the kingdom of God, it's going to cost you one life, your life. Jesus gave his one life for your one life so you can successfully live a Christian life. And when you die in Christ, you can go to heaven totally and completely perfected. I'm getting excited about it now. Now I want to do a little preaching and shouting over that. You're going to be a trophy of grace. But he told the rich young ruler, who was no doubt dependent on his riches too, he said, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. 
note. He said he lived by the law his whole life. God gave him one commandment and he had so much money that he couldn't give it up. The one thing God put his finger on, he said, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And the young man put his head down and he walked away grieved because he had much possessions. Wow. The very one thing that people are bound in sin. I've had people say, I can't give up my friends. I've had people say, I've got sins in my life. I don't want to give them up. I don't want to give up what I'm doing and where I'm at. Remember hearing years ago about a young lady heard one of the old mothers of the church stand up and testify and the blessings of God and living for Christ. And, and it moved the young lady in such a real way uh, and, and such reality in the spirit of God. She went over to this mother of the church and this lady in Zion and the young lady said to her, said, I would give the world to have what you have. And that little old wise mama looked at that young lady and she said, honey, she said, that's what I did to live for Jesus and to walk with him. She said, I gave the world up to, to go for Christ. Wow. We know what it costs dedication, but we're not left on our own. He'll live through us. He'll walk through us. And Paul went on to say, I do not frustrate the grace of God. And I know Christians get frustrated. Maybe they condemn themselves. Maybe they have felt judged or condemned by others. Did you know my Bible said that every servant stands or falls before their own master? I'm glad that God is Daryl Gaddy's judge. There'd probably be people who'd put me in hell. I don't know. I wouldn't want to put anybody there. But here's the thing about it. I'm going to be judged by God, by his word, not, not somebody else's idea. So what we need to do as children of God, folks, get your eyes off of people. Get, get, get your eyes on Jesus. You just live your life every day to please him, to follow him. Read your Bible, stay in prayer, build yourself up in your faith. And here's the thing about it. My mom is in heaven. I've been telling you that real weekly. And and uh, I because I, it's so fresh. My first Mother's Day in 65 years of life and my mama wasn't here. But you know what? I bought her a lily last year for Mother's Day, a beautiful pink lily. We set it out the back door by the porch after it all died out. I didn't know it'd ever come back. And I was out there and I looked over the side of the porch here two or three weeks ago and looked down and there that lily was greened up and had buds on it. And that lily that I gave to mama a year ago is in bloom on my porch. And I thought, look at mama, she's still sending us flowers, make me shout. But you know what? My mama can't be there when I stand before God. She won't be there saying he's a good boy or he was a bad boy or whatever. When you stand before God, you will stand for your master, for your walk. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, I'd be a Christian if it wasn't for Christians I've seen. That's another word I'll give you. That is baloney. That's, bolo that's just an excuse for people not to have to live for God. We need to get our eyes on Christ. We need to guard our walk and go all the way with Jesus Christ. Don't miss heaven. Don't miss your daily walk. Don't frustrate the grace of God. Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. 
Christ didn't die in vain, child of God. He died that you can be free. Now, I'm about out of time, and uh, I tease on here once in a while. Uh, uh, I feel another hour coming on. Amen? But turn with me real quickly to Ephesians, the third chapter, Ephesians 3 and verse 17. Now, I want to get all excited and get in your face. I'm still not used to this Facebook stuff. I don't really feel like a nerd on here. And Sunday, we had a little episode. And folks, just hang with us. Uh, if there's a mistake to be made and how this operates, probably going to do it. Uh, uh, our brother Sunday tried to make it a little adjustment on the camera. And... Uh, he hit the button. He didn't notice it at first. He hit the button that reversed the camera. So I think we had our wall in there for a while. Maybe you could hear the audio and not see me. But hey, if if we get uh, uh, Jonah on Noah's ark and get Noah up Zacchaeus's tree, uh, well, we're humans. That's possible. But we're we're trying to do a good work here. Ephesians three and seventeen that Christ dwell, may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's how you live it. You live it with Christ living in you. Keep the faith. Child of God, my friend, my brothers and my sisters, keep the faith. Keep on keeping on. Did you know the Bible said the righteous falls down seven times, but they get up? Hey, I've fallen in 50 years. I've fallen more than once. I've fallen more than twice. The key is you get up. You get up. You brush off and you start again. I'd run to my children and say, honey, let daddy help you. Get up. You can do this. You'll walk. Wow. Let me give you another freeman, freebie. Our son knew how to walk. But our daughter come along, and so, I don't know, he three years old maybe, maybe not quite, I guess. But uh, he was watching us teach our daughter how to walk, and I think just a little attention got a hold of him, maybe just a little bit of jealousy. You don't have to teach a kid that. They'll learn that real quick. And uh, he said, Daddy, can I walk to you? I said, sure, son. We knew what was going on. And we had a an old Zenith radio uh, record player, an old console in the in our house. And I said, sure, buddy, you 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 walk. And man, he was terrorizing the house, running all over the house, jumping, flipping, and uh, rolling. You understand? Well, at that moment, he reverted to the day he never took a step. He walked over. And he grabbed that uh, uh, stereo and just every step he was leaning on that stereo, every step he was leaning just like he had never. And he got right down to me and fell in my arms. Wow, now I could preach that for an hour. He wanted my, my attention. Child of God, don't you know you have your father's attention? And when you fall down, he runs to pick you up. Don't you know he wants to build you up and not push you down? Don't you know he wants to bless you? And man, that did that boy good that day, but it did this old dad good too, that my child fell in my arms. Now here's, here's something. Don't you act like you don't know how to live for God when you do know how to live for God. When you know what you ought to be doing, Hey, I've walked out of Granny's church wiping my eyes, telling God, God, someday I'll live for you. Someday I'll serve you. And one night I couldn't walk out anymore. I hit that altar and I dedicated my life to Christ and I started my walk. I'm still on my walk. I'm still wondering what would Jesus have me do. I'm still being taught in the word. I'm still being led by his spirit. I want him to teach me, to lead me, to guide me. Well, how are we going to get done if the preacher don't read? All right. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Are you at Ephesians 3 and 16? 
He said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. It starts in the inner man and is lived out through your body and your flesh. The enabler is inside and then it turns into practical daily Christian living. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded. That's part of our walk. I'm rooted in Jesus. I'm grounded in my faith. You know, I've known of people before, I'm just going to quit. I'm not going to serve God. Always quitting. You can't always be quitting. You can't always be giving up. It was like the one old boy said, well, he said, I just think I'm going to quit living for God. I'm going to, I'm going to turn it all over and give it all up. He said, but I'm going to be a man about it. He said, I'm going to go to the altar one more time and I'm going to pray. Well, he hit that altar one more time and prayed and he began to realize all the good things that God had done in his life and blessed him and helped him. And what happened? He prayed through. Nothing will help your walk more than a, a trip to beside your bed in prayer or an old-fashioned altar of prayer. And that old boy got to praying. He said, oh, God, I'm repent. I'm sorry. He said, I can't give up and quit. You've been too good to me. And that's what we got to understand. So verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints. There it is, saints, that we'll comprehend in our heart and our mind how God will love us and help us. What is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height? And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. Here's a good golden nugget before we pray and close tonight. Get full and get filled with the fullness of God. Amen. One of my favorite verses that I learned when I was a kid, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word will keep your life on, on the right path. Someone said sin will keep you from the book and the book will keep you from sin. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Here's good Bible study. We're going to pray and get off of here, but go back and dig in. I'm running over this because I'm already late here, but look what he's saying. He said, our walk is dependent upon the power working in us. Keep the power of God working in your life. Stay surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Here we are in 2020. Crazy, chaotic days. Been through coronavirus and covid they're threatening us with second rounds. I bind it in the name of Jesus and pray it can't be possible. But friend, let me tell you, whatever comes or whatever goes, I'm going to keep my hand in the hand of Jesus. And I'm going to say, Master, I surrender all. Live in me, live through me, lead me and guide me. Finish the work you've started in my life. I want to pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for those who have joined us tonight for Wednesday night Bible study. God, let the word come alive in our heart. If someone's discouraged, encourage them in their faith. God, encourage them that you'll help them. God, that you'll live in them and through them. God, show them that you'll give them strength and you'll give them joy and out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. 
Father, just bless them. If there's one under the sound of my voice who, who's not surrendered to Christ, God, let this be the day that they turn their life over to you, Jesus, and they say, God, I'm holding nothing back. I'm going to love you and serve you. Forgive me of my sin, and then just go all the way with you. Hey, We've come too far to turn back now. God bless you. You go in the name of Jesus. See you Sunday and next Wednesday, Lord willing.